Hello, good afternoon. All right, so here we are in the midst of our final assignment and final topic before the test three slash final. And we're covering a reconstruction. All right. So let's see here. Let me make sure I get down the names. And um, does anyone have any comments or questions? All right, so um, well, I have one. I'm sorry, it's Karen. Um, what chapters is the last test going to cover? The last test covers Jacksonian period through this through Reconstruction. So we are looking at, pardon me here, chapters nine through fifteen. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yes, chapters nine through 15 in Alan Brinkley's uh, textbook, okay? No, that was a good question. So let's see here. And be sure to uh, look up test three on, um, online uh, so that you'll, you'll know what's coming, right? As far as the, the format, the type of questions asked, et cetera, uh, by all means take advantage of that, okay? Let's see here. Okay, so reconstruction, right? Uh, notice, right, historians are going to uh, place, um, this is just gives you context, okay? I, uh, I don't wanna just go over the argumentative assignment uh, for philosophical reasons, I, I want to supplement what we have in the argumentative assignment and give you a surrounding context to it. But also, um, uh, there's only one number on this one, right? And so, uh, note, right, like what you're looking for is, is think about the fact that, that historians borrow from sociology the notion that, that society or, or world history uh, and society can, on a contemporary basis uh, are split into at least three categories, right? Uh, political, economic, and social. So that which you accomplish politically, right, by way of the law uh, in particular, um, may or may not suffice to, uh, to rectify an injustice that has also economic and social roots to it, right, uh, for African Americans. And so, um, and of course, you can make laws that pertain to the economic and social realm. Uh, but, but notice in this argumentative piece, right, uh, the writer's trying to make the contention that it doesn't suffice, that, that, that political rectification of wrongs, it has its place, it is necessary and vital, but it's not sufficient, right? That, that if you don't win over the hearts and minds, if you don't do something uh, as far as socializing the children, uh, and, and as far as the Sambo image with African Americans, uh, and the xenophobic fear of African Americans, uh, an absolute intolerance of social integration with African Americans, uh, intermarrying with them, eating at the same table, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, then you're going to have some issues. You're going to have some problems uh, that, that likely will not be uprooted uh, by mere laws, okay? So think of that when you... Um, Keep that in mind when you read the Reconstruction argumentative piece, all right, and contending that that political, um, you know, rectification of wrongs is great and all, but it's not sufficient. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then you also ask the question, what about motives, right? Uh, does it eventually, um, you know, backfire on you or, or prove to be insufficient when laws are implemented perhaps with the wrong motives behind them? And so just something to chew on, okay? And so the, with the basic facts, I'm not gonna go point by point here, okay? But, but notice, right, that we're dealing with like um, unresolved legacies at the end of the Civil War, right? That which was still considered a problem that needed to be addressed uh, long after the Civil War ended, okay? Um, so uh, for instance, let me make sure I get all the names. I see a couple new names here. Um, so the obvious one is, is racial prejudice, right, and racism. 
And so uh, with prejudice, right, like the words prejudge kind of inherently within that word as a conjunction, they, 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 you, um, you, you prejudge like by way of the Sambo image, right? You had um, in the midst of long before the Jim Crow laws and the antebellum period and even before that, you had, um, you know, things like um, the, uh, you know, the theater, uh, literature, et cetera in which like with the minstrel shows where they would propagate a very negative image of African-Americans, right? And we talked about this with slavery and justifying slavery, that even if there were uh, primarily, and this is very argumentative, uh, primarily economic motives and economic foundation uh, for slavery, that it was at least very much butressed uh, by racial discrimination and, and prejudice. Right, they justified it in that manner, and um, so you have notions of the African Americans, you know, being like a walking id, right, with Freud's terms, uh, just uh, impulsive, uh, lacking self control, uh, childlike, uh, irrational, uh, emotionally led by pathos instead of logos. Um, that the, the men in particular uh, were seen as uh, sexual threats to white women. Um, that they could not be trusted, that they were like the typical sycophant as a slave telling you what you wanted to hear, but at the first opportunity, uh, they would run away and abscond with something of yours, uh, or even worse, uh, you know, uh, attack you physically or, or something. And so you had those types of stereotypes that were propagated for a very long time in the South in the midst of their anti-miscegenation laws against inter-ethnic marriage and sex and procreation uh, and so forth, right? That, that dealt with the, the social realm. And so uh, you still have that to contend with at the end of the war. Uh, you also have complaints by, on behalf of quote, radical Republicans by the end of the war that the South was quote, unrepentant, that they were not sorry uh, for the war. They were not sorry uh, for, for fighting uh, against the Union and trying to secede, right? And remember, not all the Southerners, you have books like Johnny Reb, et cetera, uh, contended that they were fighting for the main maintenance of slavery anyway. And, but, but regardless of what it was, maybe it was a, a libertarian notion that Alabama should decide on slavery and no one else, then you have to contend with that libertarian notion at the end of the war. What are these rebel Yanks? What are these Republicans from the North and New England states uh, have to do with my business here in this particular county in Mississippi, okay? And so you have to contend with that type of, of, of sentiment as well, right? And then um, of course you have a sour taste in their mouth uh, from on behalf of, of just how brutal the war had become, right? It had devolved into kind of a total war where uh, non-combatants and civilians uh, had their property and even their lives threatened uh, by Sherman's army, et cetera by the end of the war, right? So you have to contend with all that stuff. And then also the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, as well as Field Order Number 13. Um, and uh, you have the notion of, uh, of, of, um, of Dunning, uh, William Dunning, D-U-N-N-I-N-G, where he contends that the North did that which it did, the radical Republicans in particular, not out of altruistic humanitarian concern for African-Americans, but to spitefully um, avenge themselves against the South, right? To make them prostate, uh, bent over and, 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 uh, and broken, right? And so at any rate, um, what better way to get at them, right? Than to confiscate Confederate property and hand it out to slaves. So you have, if you wanted to look into like Edisto Island, E-D-I-S-T-O off the South Carolinian coast, uh, they were granting, quote, 40 acres and a mule uh, to each ex-slave family. And so, uh, you know, uh, journalists from all over the world came to Edisto Island and other such places uh, to see if the African-Americans could combat the Sambo image and prove to be self-sufficient and economically responsible, uh, et cetera, right, on their own. But to a lot of people, this was not only unconstitutional in light of the Fifth Amendment that the, the government, the federal government is obliged to protect its citizens' life, liberty, and property, um, 
without, you know, outside of, of due process and being convicted of a crime, which was not the case with the Civil War, right? Remember, Lincoln at first tried to treat them as traitors and as, as a rebellion. And for the exchange of prisoners of war and other reasons, he, he succumbed, he, he gave in and said, no, I, I'm going to have to, uh, for now, uh, acknowledge the Confederacy as a belligerent, as a separate warring country against me. And so the, on a technicality, they technically couldn't do that. Uh, any longer just confiscate their property uh, without having them convicted by way of due process of a crime of some sort. So at any rate, um, they had constitutional issues, but they thought that that was just un-American. I mean, let's face it, right? American political tradition has not had much of a taste for land redistribution, taking land from someone and giving it to someone else. That's seen as being very Marxist, very radical, very leftist. Uh, in American political tradition, even to the Republicans, many of the Republicans. And it was seen as being spiteful. Uh, so uh, they had to contend with that. And matter of fact, in the case of land redistribution, the Supreme Court will rule against it uh, on behalf of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, President Johnson, after Lincoln is killed, uh, he too uh, sides with the ex-Confederates and being able to retain their lands, their properties. So at any rate, but still, right, that's going to uh, be a polarizing issue, and it's going to uh, really um, exacerbate the, the, the resentment and the fear of white Southerners, right, that they, this Republican Party, that they arguably started this war with their agitation as abolitionists and, and insistence that slavery cannot and will not spread to the Western territories uh, that would become states, right? But that also now they're trying to antagonize the white South by basically, you know, uh, flirting with class and demographic warfare between black and white Southerners. And so at any rate, all this, you know, has to be contended with, right? And then, of course, there's a white backlash when African Americans are emancipated uh, by way of the 14th Amendment. Uh, they are granted citizenship and all the rights, protections, uh, and privileges thereof. Uh, just in case it wasn't clear, included in those rights, protections, and privileges is the right of suffrage, the right to, to vote, to run for office, and to participate in politics uh, by way of the 15th Amendment. And it shall not be deprived, you shall not be deprived of it on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And so um, you have the, the a, a backlash, right, by in the form of like the, um, the, the Ku Klux Klan, right, with Nathan Bedford Forrest here uh, and other ex-Confederate cavalrymen uh, claiming that they were representing the spirits of their slain brothers of the Confederacy as their ghosts uh, and, and to keep the inwards, the uppity inwards in particular, in their place, right? And so it was nothing less from the very get-go uh, than uh, a paramilitary terrorist group. Uh, they they um, openly, uh, as you probably know, uh, up right up into the civil rights era, as they had a, a, a big kind of um, renewal or rebirth, if you will, during the 1920s, uh, they're going to go right up into the civil rights movement and being overtly political and running people for office, etc. right? And continuing that they were looking out for uh, the white man in the South. Uh, in particular, right, going back to the Freedmen's Bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau was supposed to go down into the South and to adjudicate disputes, right, to be like a referee with black and white disputes, and they were to give help the, quote, Negroes, uh, encourage them in self-help and trying to get them to become economically self-sufficient uh, in establishing schools and educating their children, and also, right, and fighting for them politically in the courts in particular. Uh, so they sent teams of, of lawyers, et cetera, uh, to, to represent African-Americans down in the South. Well, President Andrew Johnson, who was chosen as a vice presidential candidate, arguably to balance the ticket of Abraham Lincoln and to conciliate the Democrats in the North that were against the war known as Copperheads, um, he, he put this racist white Southerner of Tennessee uh, as his running mate because he remained loyal to the Union and to try to conciliate the opposition that he was not a radical abolitionist. And so now, right, he wasn't, how was he to know that he would be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at the end of the war, within days of the end of the war, 
And now this racist white Southerner who just happened to be loyal to the Union and also shared a strong antipathy, a class antipathy toward the planter class of slave owners is now the president. And so now that's another thing that needs to be contended with as context to the, the, um, the phenomenon and the history and the era of reconstruction, which they tend to put from 1865 to 1877. And so all this needs to be dealt with, right? And so, um, yeah, and so here you have with Andrew Johnson, he comes in and he makes it very clear uh, that he has a strong, equally, if not more uh, strong antipathy, uh, stronger antipathy toward African-Americans and toward what he was afraid of as Negro rule. So he, um, he vetoed uh, the continuation of the uh, Freedmen's Bureau, contending that it was a racist organization because it was bent only to help African-Americans. And what about the, the Southern whites? Um, he granted pardons in large number to Confederates uh, uh, to, um, to give them their lands back and to re-enfranchise them as citizens. Uh, especially, you know, those like particular, like with the Fort Pillow massacre of Tennessee, uh, massacring um, uh, prisoner, uh, Yankee prisoners of war, etc. And so um, very, very quickly showed his sympathy for the South uh, as the new president at the end of the Civil War. So now that's something to contend with because he has congressmen, right? Uh, we mentioned some of them last class, the um, Wendell Phillips, Benjamin Wade, Salmon Chase, um, uh, Charles Sumner, and these other quote radical Republicans who were virtually abolitionists and, and politicians, right? Uh, who were not gonna take kindly uh, to this stance by their new president. And there's gonna be a, sta a, a standoff uh, and a conflict. So at any rate, he orders the lands back to their rightful owners. He vetoes not only the continuation of the Freedmen's Bureau, but the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which according to a lot of people was considered even in that time period to be very moderate and, and rational. Uh, what it basically stated, right, is that there would be equal protection under the laws and the right in particular of property uh, for African-Americans to be able to get a job, uh, demand a salary, uh, to keep their own money, uh, to purchase or rent property, et cetera, right? To, to, to pursue happiness, if you will. And so um, uh, he, he vetoes even that moderate legislation. So what happens then is you have some events according to the narrative. Remember, they're trying to put this into a neat narrative, okay? And so, you know, sometimes things aren't that neat. Sometimes the causation that you find in the history book is rather subjective and, and, and they're making it as if that's the gospel truth as to why things happened the way they did. So I don't want to do that myself, okay? But I'm following the cause causation uh, uh, that underlines the writings of Eric Foner, uh, F-O-N-E-R. He's a well-respected historian on Reconstruction and the plight of slaves and their emancipation. So at any rate, largely on his book, right, he contends that that basically the, the president, under presidential reconstruction, remember, he doesn't even wait for Congress to meet back into session, and he begins unilaterally to make policies on how the South is going to be reintegrated or re-annexed into the Union. And you look at Article 2 with the, the executive, you're not going to find that power uh, in Article 2. So it was, it was constitutionally dubious for him to do this. And not to mention what he what what happens right is going to infuriate uh, the um, the radical Republicans in Congress. So notice right, he asked the um, antebellum leadership in the South to choose a list of candidates for uh, governors to as provincial or, or as uh, you know uh, interim governors right. And so the list, as you can imagine, were very much amenable to, to slavery because they were part of the, the cliques, right? These kind of oligarchic cliques of the Southern governments uh, before and during the Civil War. So he chooses very conservative governors. All he asks is that one-tenth of the civilian population uh, come formally and uh, sign an apology for the Civil War, uh, just one-tenth. 
And, um, and by the way, that one-tenth clause was advocated by Lincoln before him. But Lincoln, right, the, the argument was is that he had already proved his mettle, you know, in, in certain stands that, that he had taken. The Lincoln-Douglas debates, contending that he would not tolerate the extension of slavery anywhere else to the West, right? Uh, his house divided speech that they need to, to choose one or the other, uh, slavery or not. Uh, his quotes, uh, like with Joshua Giddings, that slavery's days were numbered, and that's what that's what ought to happen, and that that's what the founding fathers intended was for it to die out like a gangrenous limb. Uh, his Emancipation Proclamation, remember that only declared uh, slaves of rebels to be free, but then his subsequent support for the Thirteenth Amendment that declared all slaves free, right? And so he arguably had proved his metal uh, somewhat sufficiently to some Republicans. And then his last speech, right, was encouraging citizenship rights for some African-American men in the state of Louisiana as they were meeting in a state convention. And so, um, and, you know, he has that quote, right, where he says, with malice toward none and charity toward all, let us, you know, bind our wounds and move on. So his lenient policy uh, was, was largely publicly embraced and, and, and um, interpreted in that manner, as lenient, right, as uh, as as merciful, but when Andrew Johnson advocated the same prop, uh, you know, uh, policy, it it was construed publicly more as being pro-South, and so uh, he makes it very easy for the South to re-enter. He puts in racist governors in the interim, right, uh, before they become states again. All he asks is that they sign the Thirteenth Amendment, which abolishes slavery. But my goodness, right, you could formally abolish slavery, but there are many, a myriad of ways in which you can get around that, right? And that's what these new governments quickly did. Uh, they issued these uh, black codes, right? So you see here vagrancy laws and apprenticeship laws. So vagrancy, right? Most African-Americans were roaming and landless at the end of the war looking for their loved ones. And so if you were found um, loitering or passing through, trespassing on someone's land, you could be fined a stiff fine that they knew you could not pay and you had to work it off. And what do you know, some so-called benevolent planter, uh, oftentimes they would give first dibs to your ex master, uh, would offer to pay your fine for you and you had to work it off on his plantation. Apprenticeship law stated that they could not enter many of the artisan uh, jobs, many of the skilled work jobs. They were strictly forbade from doing so. Um, they, uh, and they had to, so, so by default, a lot of them had to go back to the plantations. And that's exactly what the, the intention was, because the planters with their disproportionate lobbyist power in, in, in government were saying, what about us? We need the labor out on the fields for our cotton, et cetera. And so now this is the way of, of doing it by way of laws. And so you had to show that you were employed, uh, and oftentimes it almost had to be, uh, by a, a planter, um, or else you could be fined and even arrested uh, for continual unemployment. And so they had ways, right, of trying to get them back onto the plantation. There's a, a, a book called Slavery in All But Name uh, that deals with this. Uh, legalized planter resolutions, right? No sales, rent, uh, no credit offered or loans, right, um, to, to any, quote, Negroes. Uh, they could not congregate in numbers larger than 50 or 100, right? They didn't, they weren't trusted to do so. They couldn't carry arms with them. And you could imagine the violence uh, um, that was suffered by African Americans uh, at the end of the, during and at the end of the Civil War, right? Matter of fact, one case, and by the way, all the juries were all white, the judges were all white. And there's a, uh, in Eric Foner's book, he gives a, a sad stat. Uh, I want to say it's 500. Don't quote me for sure, but I believe there were at least 500 cases at the end of the Civil War in Texas alone of someone going to court facing a charge of murdering a Black man, and there was not a single conviction in any of those cases. The white judges and juries exonerated them. And so no justice was, was meted out, right? And the Freedmen's Bureau attorneys and others were furious about this and insisting that they have separate Freedmen's Bureau uh, court systems 
to which the African American African American population could appeal. Um, so at any rate, um, you know, all this is going on, right? And so what the Republicans did amongst other policies and, and, and kind of MOs that they followed is they, they quote, waved the bloody shirt and they told their, their, uh, their constituents, right? What did we just fight the Civil War for? We just lost over 300,000 boys uh, in this war. And for what? The South hasn't changed one bit. They haven't done a darn thing, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to fundamentally change. And so our, our boys up to this point have, have fought for nothing. Uh, they have fought in vain. And it, it seems to have been relatively effective in 1866 as an election type of, 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 um, of method, uh, an idea. So at any rate, um, yeah, so you see all this, this terrible stuff happening, right? So then Congress issues a committee on reconstruction in the Senate. They find cases of a New Orleans riot where 37 politicians were murdered a uh, meeting in a convention in, in, in uh, Louisiana, and they were contemplating enfranchising or giving citizenship rights uh, to some black men. Um, you had a case in um, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, where uh, two uh, horse coaches uh, collided, one, one uh, you know, steered by a black man, another by a white man, and it, uh, it devolved into a bloody riot. And um, then you had uh, letters of, of Republican Yankees who had traveled down into the South uh, to investigate and came back with nothing but negative news about how unrepentant the white South was, about how there was no recourse to anything that approximated social justice for African Americans, and that things were basically the same as in the antebellum period, et cetera, et cetera. So in 1866, there were new congressional elections and an overwhelming majority of radical Republican candidates were elected into office. So I think you know where I'm going with this. Now they can numerically override by two thirds majority uh, the vetoes of the racist uh, Southern president. And that's exactly what they began to do. And they also impeached him. And so they instituted reconstruction um, uh, known as radical reconstruction, congressional reconstruction, and to uh, Southerners, uh, white Southerners, uh, also known as Negro Reconstruction, because what happens here? So notice they put the South into five military districts, every state except Tennessee, because Tennessee had cooperated earlier on. Um, and they gave them power to declare martial law. And that's gonna happen at one point under Ulysses Grant's presidency next. Uh, in which he is going to declare martial law at times in limited fashion against the KKK. And so you're going to have, you know, bloody fights between Yankee troops and, and, and rebellious white Southerners uh, during Reconstruction. You have, um, uh, let's see here, one-tenth pardon requirement was repealed. Now they had to approve not only the 14th Amendment, but the 15th Amendment. And look at Article 2 on the 14th Amendment, the on oath violations. If you had promised to uphold the Constitution, remember in any capacity that's in the military, that's in a political office, and who tended to monopolize the, the military uh, officer positions and the politician positions, those who were a part of or represented as a lobbyist, uh, the, the, the planter class, the well-to-do slave owning class in the South, right? If you had done so and then uh, supported the rebellion you were to be disenfranchised. You were to be stripped of your citizenship rights for two years. So now, right, the cream of the crop, if you will, right, uh, the, the oligarchy of the pre-Civil War South is now disenfranchised for two years. And so now at this point, de facto, right, you're going to have a lot of people who were uh, union Whigs, who were, uh, you know, not necessarily anti-slavery, uh, but they were kind of anti-planter class, and many of whom stayed loyal to the Union during the war. You're going to have white Republicans known as scalawags or like traitors uh, who chose uh, the, the Yankee Republican, quote, Negro Party that freed the slaves. Um, and uh, they're going to constitute evidently numerically the majority of, of politicians that are now elected uh, after 1866. And then you're going to have the, the infamous 
carpetbaggers, uh, whom many historians contend have been wrongly given a, a, a bad name. Uh, the idea right with the carpetbaggers is that they were parasites uh, coming down to take advantage of the war-torn South uh, to enrich themselves predominantly. So a lot of Yankees moved down into the South at the end of the Civil War, and they were Republicans. And then also, of course, the freedmen and, and African Americans, the freedmen who had been emancipated and once had been slaves, and um, African Americans in free African American communities like um, Charleston, South Carolina, New Orleans, Louisiana, et cetera. So at any rate, right, uh, at this time, you were going to get, what is it here? Let me look at my facts. Um, over 600 state assemblymen and 16 congressmen, including two senators uh, that were African-American that are now for the first time uh, politicians, elected politicians in cities, right? Like Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. You're gonna get a majority of local government officials who were elected into office and are black, right? Uh, including mayors, uh, policemen and sheriffs, uh, judges, uh, land commissioners and surveyors, right? Uh, et cetera. So you could imagine, remember the whole idea of Dunning's thesis, how the white South is gonna feel that way, right? that now the, the, the white Republicans in the North are just sticking it to them. They're kicking them while they're down. They're using the black man to gain an ally, uh, to gain their votes, right? In collaboration in Congress and to uh, punish the white South. And remember some of the radical Republicans were unapologetic about that. And they contended that, hey, they, they don't have to be either or, it can be both, that they could have both altruistic designs to help out African Americans, and also uh, kind of vindictive designs uh, to deal punitively with the white South and put them in their place. And I think of Thaddeus Stevens as an example of that by his own, uh, you know, his own tongue. So you see some of them here, right? Um, Hiram Revels, uh, that's Robert Elliott, uh, that's Francis Cardoso, um, and so uh, some of the, the well-known um, African-American politicians. So like I said, I would recommend Eric Foner's books on Reconstruction. I would recommend a classic by W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Black Reconstruction in America, uh, as a couple examples that you uh, might be interested in if you wanted to engage in further reading on this very interesting topic, okay, of Reconstruction. So this was considered no less than revolutionary, right? For a couple years uh, with so many black politicians. And some of them, I kid you not, uh, according to Foner, at first, it was kind of an evolution. <clears throat> at first, those who tended to uh, be elected into office tended to be those who had already been given some element of deference by their fellow black communities, right? Uh, so a lot of like preachers, um, artisans and skilled workers who formed the, the, the minority exception of being able to have such a job, right? And shopkeepers, et cetera, and some of the black enclaves. Um, you had um, ex-soldiers who had, an, you know, an enhanced confidence and self-esteem and expectations having fought for the Union Army, right? We talked about the 54th Regiment, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, you have those um, you have that phenomenon. But then, right, he contends that by the end of, of 1868, Foner contends, you had this kind of evolution or transition into a lot of elected Black politicians who literally had been slaves on plantations, many of whom were not even literate because they didn't even have the chance to become such. And so hence, they had to have a recorder to, uh, to read and, and to scribe and write things on their behalf right? And so this is just incredible. This is revolutionary to have a largely, you know, not no fault of their own, uh, illiterate, marginalized, exploited, enslaved demographic uh, now participating in government, right? On behalf of their states and localities, etc. It's just, it's tremendous. Um, uh, the, the 180 degree turn here. And a lot of them, right, embraced the Republican platform, uh, they wanted to subsidize railroads and, 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 and 
and modernize the South, right? They wanted infrastructure development. They wanted uh, import tariffs to protect uh, nascent, like beginning uh, industries, right? Um, they wanted uh, kind of a safety net legislation, if you will, uh, laws and, and, and money expended and subsidized from the government to help out those who needed that safety net. So uh, orphanages, asylums, uh, penitentiaries, um, um, uh, of course, public schooling. Public schooling was one of arguably the biggest accomplishments of Reconstruction. Uh, supposedly, according to Foner, uh, literacy went from less than 5% uh, amongst African Americans in the South to over 40%, 40 percent, four zero, uh, in the South by way of the Freedmen's Bureau schools, uh, the black private schools, and of course these public schools uh, that, by the way, you guys, with the exception of two states, were integrated, uh, black and white, okay? Uh, but there was white flight and a lot of white uh, families refused to send their white children to these schools. Um, and so you have a couple quotes here. You have the quote up here, right? They have a genuine interest and a genuine earnestness in the, oh shoot, I can't, I can't read that behind your names but uh, I'll, I'll be happy to post this, okay? Uh, but uh, like I said, some of the, um, some of the politicians have, have earned a, a great name, uh, some of these black politicians in history from this. Nevertheless, despite this, right, W.E.B. Du Bois and other historians like Foner uh, address the accusation of profligacy and corruption. Um, the profligacy, uh, that tends to be more objectively verified, uh, a lot of the Southern states uh, spent themselves into debt, okay? But just imagine the hole from which African-Americans are trying to climb, right? Uh, as far as, like I mentioned, with some of the safety net legislation and some of the works of, of creating a new South, uh, you know, they just literally didn't have the funds to do such. So they repeatedly took out loans, they issued bond certificates, and in some cases, it had a negative short and long-term economic repercussions, all right? Um, and then with corruption, uh, the argument is, right, is that they weren't any worse than anyone anywhere else. Uh, remember, the 1870s are, are part of what um, Mark Twain uh, entitled the Gilded Age, right? Something that's gilded, right, on the, on the superficial level. You put a, um, you know, some type of, of of um, metal, of shiny metal on the top of it to make it look nice, uh, but you scratch the surface and it's likely corrosive and, um, you know, underneath. And so the Gilded Age it, it encapsulates, right, uh, the, the popular image of this time period. Uh, corruption was rife at this time. So you have things like graft and bribery, right? Uh, people, right, like uh, uh, nepotism, uh, giving jobs out to, uh, to family members and friends, uh, taking bribes for someone to have a contract with your local government uh, to provide, you know, the, the, whatever it is, the water, the utilities that are coming up in the 1870s, uh, um, garbage disposal, whatever it might be, um, construction, and, uh, and then also inside information, right? Knowing when and where uh, development is going to occur and use that inside information from your political office uh, to purchase that land uh, and, and basically flip it, uh, wait for the, the, um, the property value to skyrocket and then sell it for profit. Uh, things like that were, were happening uh, indubitably, uh, but the argument is is certainly not any more amongst black politicians in the South than they were everywhere else in the country uh, for that matter. But the press is gonna run with this going to contend that the quote Negroes are like children uh, who have no knowledge of politics and government and political science and are uh, mismanaging uh, the state's funds, uh, enriching themselves at the expense of the white folk, etc. So you have the re-enfranchisement of the white South by virtue of Article 2 of the 14th Amendment, right? Their two years came up and now they're re-enfranchised. Uh, they use their political capital to their utmost. Um, the KKK survived, uh, sadly, very, uh, very effectively. And um, 
I was very surprised to see this number that it wasn't higher, but about 20%, I believe, phone or SADS, right? A, a, about a fifth of African Americans that went to the polls to vote um, were uh, physically attacked. And my goodness, the, the number would be much, much higher if they could somehow tangibly uh, ascertain the number of African Americans who were physically threatened if they should go to the poll and vote on election days, right? So the KKK came back with a lot of force or survived um, despite the federal government's, you know, military ventures against it. Um, so there was intimidation. Uh, there was the re-enfranchisement of a lot of the, the white Southern leaders, right? And then you had waning interest in the North. I mean, reconstruction was 12 years. That's a long time to keep your attention. You know, just think of 9-11, 12 years later by 2013, right? As far as the whatever kind of sentiment that it whipped up momentarily, 12 years is a long time to keep that sentiment, you know, um, ablaze. So at any rate, uh, they're also going to have issues, right, when you do your, your, um, your 17B class uh, with the, the Far West, fighting with the Sioux and the other tribes of Native Americans, the, the whole cowboy you know, motif and all that going on. Uh, there's lots of other things going on. The Gilded Age drama with the robber barons and all the technological marvels and the class warfare and the industrial sectors of the world, the populist farmers. There's all kinds of other issues going on in the span of those 12 years. So largely there's kind of waning um, interest on behalf of the Northern public and Northern politicians uh, by the mid to late 1870s. And then um, ultimately, and this is far from an exhaustive source of reasons why Reconstruction failed, but these are the main reasons that are usually put down in the history books. And then ultimately you had a, um, a, uh, a compromise on behalf of a presidential candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, no one won uh, a majority of electoral points, only a plurality. If you don't get a majority, uh, right, the top two are decided upon by the House of Reps. And so in doing that, supposedly Rutherford B. Hayes made a promise that to the Southern uh, Reps that he would evacuate the South, uh, remove the Yankee troops and leave the South on its own virtually, right? Um, should they choose him as the presidential candidate um, instead of Samuel Tilden? And so that's exactly what they did, and that's exactly what he did. He evacuated the South from of of, South, of Yankee troops, and then the South is going to circumvent. It's going to go around uh, the civil rights legislation and the 13th through 15th amendments, and they're going to have grandfather clauses. They're going to have poll taxes and literacy tests. Uh, they're going to gerrymander uh, where they they manipulate the districts. Uh, they're going to do all kinds of manipulative schemes uh, to disenfranchise African Americans, uh, but not strictly on paper, right? They were smarter than that, than, uh, than overtly stating Black people cannot do such and such. And so these are going to be known as the Jim Crow laws, right? And they're going to have to, you know, I don't know if you would say start from scratch, but they're going to certainly have to finish this job during the Civil Rights Movement in your 17B class, right? in the 1950s and 60s. All right, so are there any questions about the general narrative of reconstruction? You guys are awfully quiet. All right, so if there aren't any other questions, you guys, that, that's all I have for today. So it's just one section, and this is your last assignment. Thank you, Jose. Um, I've had another question, Ms. Karen. Sure. Um, so when will the final be posted? What, a certain day or something, or? Yes. Now, is it um, is it posted in modules? I don't think so. Oh shoot! Well, oh. that will be rectified immediately after this video. Okay. I will I will post it on modules immediately. Okay. 
Um, yes, Irina, we will as well, um, as I have for tests one and two. Um, I uh, Next week, uh, uh, the same time period, right, uh, Tuesday at one o'clock, uh, I will go through the final test with you. No problem. I'd be happy to. All right. Any other questions? You sure? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Thank you, Karen. Okay. So yes, I will. I will I will post test three. Uh, please look at it ahead of time by all means. Okay. And you guys will do well. You do very well on these. Okay. Okay, good. If it is posted, that's great. I'll I'll double check as soon as I'm done with this video. Um, but yeah, all right. And this is it, you guys. We're almost finished. So congratulations. You're pretty much there. You're right at the finish line. All right. So have a good week. Okay, you guys. And if you have any other concerns, I will catch up on my Canvas messages as I have just posted my grades from my other school uh, yesterday. So that takes a load off and that, that, that ought to help you guys. So thank you. Okay. Have a good week. Okay. Bye-bye.